It's the evening of the 14th of October, 1066. Duke William has just defeated Harold Godwinson at the Battle of Hastings. In doing this, he has now removed much of the Anglo-Saxon resistance to his throne. But not all is complete, as his next move is to get their nobility to submit to his rule. By this time, he and his army were restless after the hard battle that had just taken place throughout the day. William calls for supplies from over the channel, just in case there's more upcoming conflict. The Norman army spent the night at Hastings, where William waited to see if any Anglo-Saxon nobles might come and surrender to him, although no one turned up. According to a story at the time, following the battle, Harold's mother Gertha offered the Duke the weight of her son's body in gold in return for the body, but it was refused on William's orders. It has been rumoured that Harold was stripped of his armour and thrown into the sea, although another tale suggests that his body was buried on top of a cliff. This is most likely a Saxon tale as it has more of a respectable ending, although we don't know if any of these stories are actually true. Once his supplies arrived, and now of course with a rested army, William starts to send troops to seize Winchester, which was also where the royal treasury was held. This is a very important tactic, as now no Anglo-Saxon future king or nobility can reward their followers, whilst William is now in the position to do so. On the 20th of October, on his route, he storms the small town of Romney in Kent. In the same week, he also attacks and captures both Dover and Canterbury. During this time there, William and his men become very sick. With the port of Dover now his, William can now start to bring reinforcements over in a much safer way. The Duke and his men are now not as vulnerable from attack, now that he's secured little areas of southeast England. Once William and his troops' health improved, they continued to march onwards. It was clear to him that the Saxons were not going to surrender, so he sets up a cunning plan to push the remaining nobility out of large cities. Much like London with its massive fortified stone walls, sensing the sheer loss of just directly attacking the city, William continues staying west and going around it. As they went along their way, they continued to destroy many farms and villages, with the hopeful intention of making the remaining Saxons petrified. Much like William had done previously in Hastings, prior to the arrival of Harold. As he had hoped, the fearsome reputation of William's large army spread as they gradually moved on their way, which made much of the population from the southeastern part of England feel petrified and immediately surrendered as fast as they possibly could. This caused London in particular to be on a much higher alert, now that it's full of the last renowned Saxons. At this point in time, William thinks he has defeated all claimants blocking his throne but there's one that he has yet to discover, Edward the Confessor's great-nephew, Edgar Aethling. His father, Edward the Exile, was the son of King Edmund Ironside, and his half-brother being King Edward the Confessor. Edgar and his family, consisting of his father Edward, his mother Agatha, and his two sisters Margaret and Christina, were supposedly called by Edward to return to England, as he named Edward to be his successor. Not long after arriving in England, though, he died. Although the cause of his death is still unknown to this day, it does sound very suspicious. Nobody knows if Edward the Confessor also made Edgar his heir after his father's death. We know that Edward did make many promises during his long reign. According to William, both Harold and Edward promised him the crown of England. In 1016, King Canute invaded England. Edward was a young boy at this time and ran to Normandy where his distant cousin William let him safely stay there until he finally became the King of England in 1042, and made William his heir. After a shipwreck off the coast of Normandy in 1064, Harold was handed over to William, who forced Godmanson to swear an oath to him, stating that he would help him become the next King of England. Of course, Harold did break his promise in 1066 when he crowned himself King. With Edgar, it might have made more sense, as he was the closest blood relative, but it was likely that it wasn't even considered after Edward's death in 1066. Due to Edward being considered too young, he was approximately aged 14 to 15. They felt he was not strong enough, not competent enough to become king, and most importantly, he had no experience as a military leader. Harold, who was around the age of 44 and was Edward's son-in-law, was definitely believed to have had those traits. This meant that he had lots of powerful people backing him to be the next king. From bishops to nobles, including his own family, the Godwins, who were the most powerful family in England. After the events of Hastings, and with Harold dead, 
Much of the surviving Anglo-Saxon nobility agreed that because Edgar was the closest male blood relative, that he had the strongest claim to the English throne. Eldred, who was the Bishop of Worcester, the Abbot of Tavistock and the Archbishop of York, who also became one of Edward the Confessor's diplomats and a military leader, became one of those people to support the teenage prince. Another man who initially worked to get him on the throne was Stigand, the Archbishop of Canterbury, until he had a change of heart. It's believed that he didn't agree with Harold becoming king. This may be because of the influence from Pope Alexander II, as he also supported William's claim to the throne of England. A large debate took place in London between some of the remaining bishops, abbots and earls, including the two brothers Edwin and Morcar. Coming from a prominent family, they both owned the two largest earldoms, Mercia and Northumbria, making them, if not, the most powerful earls in England, much like how the Godwins were described. In the middle of October 1066, the Witten did eventually elect Edgar Aethling as king. According to records at the time, he didn't actually have a coronation. Maybe it was all too much for Edgar, as it hadn't initially been planned. We do know that in disagreement with many of the earls that had committed to Edgar's cause, Stigand and other disagreeing nobles, who decided that the new Norman invader would be a stronger leader. They rode to the town of Wallingford, Oxfordshire, in early December, where William was planning to find a suitable place to cross the River Thames with his army. Stigand and his companions approached William and submitted to him, and swore to serve him. Duke William eventually crosses the Thames and makes his way to the nearest town of Berkhamstead to continue on his warpath. When entering the town, the individuals there surrender, as all the towns did when they saw what followed. In doing this, William now gets access to the town's fortifications, which would later be turned into a Mott and Bailey, a new idea of defence invented by the Normans and later brought to England. William's stay at Berkhamstead is short-lived, as he's met rather surprisingly by the leading men of London. The two brothers Edwin and Morcar, Eldred the Archbishop of York, and the most notable figure of all, Edgar Aethling. They all submit to him, swearing to obey him and offered him the crown. William is now victorious. It's not clear as to why the Saxons surrendered, it certainly seemed like they had the upper hand, and with London still theirs, I'm sure they could have put up a strong resistance, even with Edgar as their leader. But with King Harold dead and many of the best warriors in England now gone, I suppose they felt that submission was better than fighting. On Christmas Day 1066, William was crowned at Westminster Abbey, becoming King William I of England, otherwise known as William the Conqueror. With the large Anglo-Saxon crowd outside, most of them accepting him as king, and many raising their fists, the Norman knights outside took this as protest, and started to set fire to the houses within the area, with smoke later filling the abbey. Now William has won the English throne, his next task is to reward his followers that fought alongside him at Hastings. He convinced people to join in on the invasion with the promise of land and money, and that's exactly what he does next. One of the most famous of the Norman nobles that fought alongside William was his half-brother William Fitz Osborne, who was granted the Isle of Wight, much of Hampshire and most of Western England. He later became the Bishop of Exeter and served as a regent whilst William went back home to Normandy. William's other half-brother Odo, who had funded the ships for the invasion of England, was also well rewarded, becoming the Earl of Kent and one of William's most trusted royal minister. Later on, William sent rich gifts to the Pope, thanking him for his support throughout. This was most likely from the Royal Treasury in Winchester. As for the Anglo-Saxons, anyone who fought against William at Hastings would lose the right to their land. Although people like Edwin and Morcar got to keep their earldoms as they didn't fight at Hastings. Both Stigand and Eldred kept their positions and William also offered rewards to those who were loyal to him. Later on, William starts to introduce new things to England, like castles, the feudal system, which is a way of organising society into different groups, and the Doomsday Book, a huge survey of land and landholding in England. William doesn't get to have a peaceful reign as he had hoped. He spends many years dealing with rebellions in both Normandy and Northern England, but changes England forever. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please consider liking and subscribing.